Okay, welcome everyone. This is Candace with the Mountain View Library. And today's program is how to be a weed warrior with the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County. They've been uh, graciously giving us bi-monthly programs for several years now, and they have seamlessly transitioned to their virtual programs. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to the Master Gardeners. Thanks. Uh, my name is Pamela Trounstein. I am a Master Gardener, and with me I have uh, Louise, who's also a Master Gardener, and um, I'm really happy to be here today. Weeds happen to be a uh, passion of mine, and certainly something that most gardeners have to deal with at some point. So um, <clears throat> I want to make sure that you love gardening and that weeds haven't taken over uh, your gardening time. So I would love to start with uh, a question. Um, and uh, if you could tell me, hang on just a second, um, what weeds motivated you to uh, come listen today? Go ahead and type it in the chat. Mm hmm. Yep, these look familiar. <laughs> HOA mandates. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Oh, Bermuda grass. Yes, that's what I was dealing with this morning, weeding before I started today. Mm hmm. Oxalis. Yep, so much oxalis. Awesome. Well, you can keep adding uh, to your list, and I'll keep taking a peek at the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I'd love to introduce sort of what Master Gardeners are. We are trained volunteers from um, the UC system, and we are, um, uh, there's, there's Master Gardeners in every county um, in Santa Clara. We are here to help all residents um, and help you with gardening and gardening science and all that good stuff. Um, we have a number of uh, programs. We have our um, help desk, which is where how m many of you probably have um, reached out to us before, um, where you can send us an email and even include pictures and ask your um, gardening questions. Um, we had walk-in and um, other options, but the county office is currently closed. So um, those things are temporarily suspended. Um, as is the new Master Gardener class. But we do hope to restart um, training new volunteers for the 2023 class. So if anybody's interested, you wanna keep an eye on our website in early 2022 for the application. Um, <clears throat> we volunteer many hours every year in many capacities um, and also receive ongoing training to stay on top of the science. I would highly encourage you to sign up for our tips and events. Um, if this is not how you found out about this particular event, um, we, you can contact our, the, what the screen right there is our homepage. Um, and if you have a gardening question, that's how you can reach the help trust, help desk. Um, you can request a speaker for a group, um, and you can sign up for that, uh, e-newsletter for tips and events that will give you timely information and then a list of all of our events, regardless who, uh, who is hosting. Um, and Louise just posted that in the chat too, so. Um, thank you so much for your feedback about what kind of weeds you've got and everything. Um, and I do hope to arm you with information for that uh, ongoing weed battle as we uh, go on this hour. Um, the first thing I would like to introduce, um, which is in the talk description, is integrated pest management. Um, this is a process that you can use to solve pest problems um, while minimizing risks to people in the environment. Um, this is the Master Gardener way. This is the state of California way. Um, and uh, IPM um, can be applied to any kind of pest problem you have. Um, and it focuses on long-term prevention of pests and damage by um, you know, long-term management. IPM programs combine four styles. Um, I'm gonna introduce each one of those briefly. Um, biological control, 
Examples of biological control of weeds would be releasing an insect that has an appetite for a problem plant, often a sterile insect, um, or hiring goats to consume the weeds in a regional or county park. Cultural controls, um, hand weeding would be the prime example of cultural control. Adjusting irrigation in the winter to limit weed germination, checking your pants and shoes for barbed seeds before you leave an area you've just been hiking are other behaviors that make a difference. Mechanical and physical controls, mostly on the weed side, we're focusing on physical controls. Um, but you know, if you've heard Master Gardener talk before, you've heard we are big fans of mulching and this would be an example of a physical control. Um, and then finally, chemical control. Chemical control is the use of um, pesticides and in particular um, herbicides for weeds. Um, they're used only when, in, only when needed and in combination with other approaches for a more effective long-term long control. We will talk about those again um, later um, in the presentation, but they are uh, selected and applied in a way that um, minimizes their possible harm to people, non-target organisms, and the environment. So with IPM, you use the most selective pesticide that will do the job and uh, will be safest for everybody else involved. So. Mm -hmm. And then there are a couple of other search terms that I would love for you to know, um, because these are so handy, um, when you are doing Google searches. Um, I mentioned that Master Gardeners are trained volunteers of the UC Extension Program. Um, UCANR is an acronym for the University of California Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources, which uh, UC system and Master Gardeners fall under. Um, and uh, IPC um, is uh, also known as Cal IBC for California. That's California's Invasive uh, Plant Council. So if you get nothing else out of this presentation, you can find everything I'm presenting here from these two agencies and their, their information on their websites. If you do a Google search for say, plant with spikes and yellow flowers and add UCANR to your search, you can double or triple the chances of finding weeds that have been seen growing in California and information relevant to our local climate for finding out more about it and eradicating it. Um, if, it's some, if it's invasive somewhere in California, IPC has risk assessment data to support why and how much of a problem your weed is, so you can know. Other organizations worth looking into, um, again, these are all in your handout, um, plantright.org. It's focused on making sure plants sold in the horticultural trade are well-behaved species. And Play Clean Go, a national effort from the North America Invasive Species Man Management Association that's focused on reducing the hu human spread of pests and diseases. And then, you know, we all have pictures in our mind of what is a weed, um, but it's in its simplest definition, a weed is a wild plant growing where it's not wanted and in competition with cultivated. Now, I get your pens and pencils ready because, you know, I've got the weed books here and, uh, you know, we got a lot of stuff to cover. This is just one of two. There's 382 something weeds in this book, you know, so no, just kidding. We are never going to be able to cover that many weeds in this period of time. What I want to do is um, help you find the information that you need so that when a new weed crops up next month, you know what to do about it too. Okay, so a couple other terms um, that are useful to know. Um, natives. Um, native plants are indigenous to the state of California, um, but natives actually can be weeds too. I mean, poison oak is a native species, but you probably don't want it in your garden where your dog goes exploring. But most often we're concerned that natives important to our ecosystem are being crowded out by non-native weeds. Uh, naturalized plants, um, it's a non-native plant, it can survive, it can reproduce um, for an indefinite period of time. It, it usually plays nicely in our space. A good example would be jade. Jade is a house plant, an outdoor plant all over the world, um, native to South Africa, but um, plays nicely with other plants and doesn't escape its pots or where it's planted. 
Um, we call many of those water-wise plants from Australia, et cetera, that do really well in our garden naturalized as well. Um, garden examples might be pineapple guava or poker plant. They don't spread away from where they're introduced except for a small space and they won't escape to wild areas. Noxious is an actually legal term used by regulatory agencies like the California Department of Food and Agriculture. In the past, the concern were plants or weeds, as I think about it, as that were interfering with agricultural crops. But in the past few decades, it's expanded to plants that interfere with habitat and food for native species and healthy waterways. And now, of great concern, wildfires. Um, here is a little chart of sort of, you know, is your weed inconvenient or invasive? Um, in the spring, it totally feels like every weed in your garden is a problem, um, but many of the weeds that we'll deal with are just sort of byproducts of the history of agriculture and come by way of seed contamination or machinery or something like that. Um, but invasive species are not actually limited to wildland in California, and your ability to recognize Invasive species in your backyard and your neighborhood and taking action to contain them and stop small problems from becoming big invasions is really crucial to the state's overall success in the war on these particular plants. 40% uh, or 48% or so of the invasive plants were originally introduced uh, via the horticultural trade, which is where an organization like Plant Right um, is trying to make sure that as we bring new plants um, through the nursery industry to market um, that they don't become a problem. And then I totally encourage you, I know most of you are, are busy listening, but I encourage you uh, to go to this particular website. It's on your handout as well, the, the uh, Cal IPC Don't Plant the Pest um, page has information broken down by regions and statewide and these are really the hot button plants um, that we're concerned about. And um, many of them are uh, in our local space. In fact, this weekend, you probably won't be able to drive anywhere to enjoy the great outdoors without seeing a couple of these species that are a problem. Um, brooms, the whole category of brooms, regardless of what it's called, um, brooms would be uh, covering the hillsides. Um, between here and Santa Cruz, you really can't drive 17 without seeing how much of um, Caltrans property along the highway has been taken over by brooms. So that's one. Um, I'm just selecting a few from the website. Pompous grass. You probably heard about this one um, and you can't go anywhere along 280 without seeing this one. So pepper trees. Um, pepper trees have been planted all over um, the county and were very popular for a while, um, but they are invasive and um, the, they are sort of also unattractive because the branches have been known to um, fall and smash cars and things like that. So um, edible fig is a surprising uh, one on this list. Um, many people have fig trees in their backyard not that big a deal. I, I'm not suggesting at this moment that you take out a fig tree um, that is in your yard and producing figs, but um, this is sort of a good example of how um, a tree that makes something really attractive to animals um, is uh, somewhat hard to contain sometimes because it is possible for animals to take fig seeds somewhere else and for the thing to, to thrive as a weed. And then this is the one that drives me the most nuts. Uh, tree of Heaven, also known as Tree of Hell, <laughs> all of, also known as Elianthus. Um, this one is everywhere and uh, a very woody, very easy to spread tree. It was brought um, uh, along the railroad and gold rush time periods um, as a fast growing tree that provided shade and um, it's a tough one to eradicate here. Um, there are plenty more on their websites, um, and I totally encourage you to um, check out all the ones for the state and get to know them by sight. And then the USDA also maintains a list of invasive species, and that's worth checking too. Um, right there, sacred bamboo, otherwise known as um, heavenly bamboo or nandina. 
Um, it often appears in landscaping here when it's really happy, which is not always where I see it growing. It sends out runners. Birds contribute to the spread because they eat the berries. But the real bummer is that the berries contain cyanide compounds, and so they end up being toxic to the birds, not that the birds always know. So it's kind of a bummer for wildlife. Um, and privet is popular too, and it's fine as a formal hedge where the flowers and the berries are regular, regularly cut off. If you have a privet hedge in your yard, I'm not suggesting you take it out, um, but where it's allowed to grow unchecked or as a tree, those dark purple seeds are spread extensively by birds. And if you've ever had to deal with this in your yard, by the time a seedling is like four inches high, it's already too tough to hand pull and you have to get a shovel. So um, documentation for California is a little bit behind on these two species, but they are being discussed and we should expect them to see them on California list very soon. Okay, um, and then sort of three questions to develop your weed, um, your weed strategy. And the first one I'm about to ask you actually is what kind of problem do you have? What kind of tools or tech do you have available to you? And what's the biology of your target species? So let me jump first to the first question. Tell me where are you weeding? Are you in your backyard in the city center? Are you on a few acres along the urban wildlife interface? Where is it that you are um, that you are doing most of your weeding. Okay, oh, I see somebody with a slope. All right, yep, those are different considerations to a city backyard and Mm-hmm. And we have some friendly squirrels and birds that love to co-plant. So even if all you have are pots, you still probably deal with some weeds. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Well, you guys can keep those going. Um, I'm going to just jump into my next slide real quick. I'm going to keep an eye on the, the chat as I go. Um, let's talk about sizing up your enemy. Um, the weed on the left and the weed on the right, they are the same weed. This is my friend Mallow, and I mean friend, because the little weed on the left side, I literally reached over and plucked it while I was walking down the path in my backyard. But when I moved into this yard that had absolutely no landscaping whatsoever, the Mallow looked like the picture on the right. That is a six foot tall fence with a seven foot extension. I was just, I took this picture a week ago. I was just there today. It has reached over to the lattice side of the fence. Um, this weed has an incredibly stiff, deep taproot and it's really tough to get. Um, so, you know, it really depends where you are, but also what stage your weed is, right? If you live by the freeway, like I do, um, you probably have a steady supply of windblown, windblown weeds from roadsides, machinery that's transporting stuff on the freeway. If your neighbor has ivy growing up to the fence or a glossy privet with those berries hanging over it, you're managing a different problem. If you live in South County in your open space, you might have yellow star thistle concerns. Or if you're in the hills behind Las Gatis, French broom or acacia might actually be your pain point. Um, but it does, it really does depend on how much space you're responsible for weeding and how big those weeds are. Um, you know, what your strategy uh, might be for this guy. So, you know, example on the ref, left, I can grab that and just keep walking. And example on the right, I'm going to pull out some shovels and probably some bypass pruners to get a handle on that. So, <clears throat> uh huh. Okay. So, I see some people are actually dealing with some brooms right there in their yard. Mm -hmm. Driveway cracks. Yes, yes. This time of year is the time of year. It's, it's, that's a problem I love that disappears in the summer, but in the spring, it's always something we have to, to think about. So, um, oh yes, great, 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 great. Thank you guys for your comments. Um, so when you are trying to uh, understand your weeds, um, there are a couple of things that are really helpful um, that you'll see in descriptions of weeds, but also um, 
will help you with IDing if you can notice some of these things. So um, the structure and characteristics of our weeds, we have sort of five categories. Broadleaf, majority of the weeds that we think of are broadleaf. Um, there's sort of three categories there. They could be broadleaf and they stand up tall. They could be broadleaf and they spread out um, as like a flat rosette. Um, or they could be scrambling, which usually means that they may grow flat for a little while until they find something to grab onto and then they climb up that space. Um, <clears throat> a graph uh, is a sort of stems with nodes. Think rings like bamboo on a smaller scale. You probably notice when your grass, your turf grass got too long, you know, that you, what that looks like. Um, but um, any grassy weed you're looking at, um, would uh, would have the same thing. It's, you should often they're ta they're taller if they if they're uh, left alone. But determining a grass versus sedge is really tough um, sometimes. Um, sedges don't have any nodes, um, so they don't have those little things where you have one flower and there's like a ring like you would expect for bamboo, and then you know a couple inches up there's another one that comes the other direction. They don't have any nodes. And the stem is often triangular shaped. So that is often the, the clue that um, you recognize. And um, the picture that I have right there, that is nut sedge in a turf lawn. Um, and it can be tough when you have like a, a, a mix of lawn seed, you know, for a sturdy turf to identify nut sedge versus, um, which is a weed versus some of the other, uh, you know, the, the turf that you want in there, but a good way of thinking about it for turf, as I noticed many of you were talking about weeds uh, of concern in the lawn, is that if you mow your lawn, and so it's this nice, even, you know, mo moderate height, and you come back two days later and something is bright green and taller, probably double the height of the rest of the grass, that's probably nut sedge. Okay, so sometimes when we mow it, so we don't really get to see the whole structure of the thing, that's how you can identify it. Um, if it grows up a fence or a tree, or it forms a really thick, thick mat, think vine. Um, and the really good news is that you don't actually have to identify um, whether a certain plant um, that is bigger in, in a shrub sort of shape, whether it's really a shrub or a tree, because we just call those woody weeds and they will often grow um, in different shapes, depending on what else is around them and whether they're being shaded or in an open area, et cetera. So um, you can just use the term woody. And then there's three types of growth habits. There's the annual, um, and that's, uh, here's a good example. This is Poa annua or annual bluegrass. I bet if I asked, half of you would have seen it um, somewhere in your yard already this year. Um, those are a lot of seed heads. So it can be a real problem for a short period of time, but it's a spring thing. It comes up right now and it will go away whether or not you pay any attention to it. The thing is that if it spread all those seeds, then it's gonna come back more next year. Um, but otherwise, you only have to deal with that plant one time per year, which is sometimes a relief. Um, and then you've got perennial plants as dandelions. Dandelions will always be around, maybe till the apocalypse. And then you have a narrower category of plants called biennials. And they have an interesting way of growing. Most of the time, biennials will grow some sort of flat, we call this prostate um, sort of uh, rosette. Um, and this is a good example. There's a shoe, for example, this is bull thistle. In its first year, it grows very flat like that. Um, you wouldn't see it unless you were right up on it. It's very prickly. Um, it is extremely weak when it is in this stage. So if somebody was out there with a shovel or something, you'd be able to pull it up no problem. The problem is most of the time we see this is in wildland spaces or county parks where unless you're right on top of it, you don't see it. And the next year, it's this thing. And nobody wants to weed that thing. And look at all of the thistles, all of the seed heads that are about to blow in the wind, right? So. Um, that's where it can be helpful to know um, what type of uh, growth habit your weed has. And then I'm just gonna give you a couple stats on weeds. Um, I made these up, no, I didn't make them up. Actually, I took 100 and something of the most sort of popular weeds um, that we deal with here and took a look at how they reproduce. 
and 95.5% of the weeds that I looked at reproduce by seed. There's a few <laughs> that reproduce vegetatively only. And let's talk about those really quick. Vinca major, here's another one of those do not plant pests. Um, big leaf periwinkle. Um, you won't find it in nurseries anymore, but you may find it in somebody's yard and it grows like ivy and it's just as much of a pain in the butt. It's pretty, but it's an invasive species and a big problem. Um, this grows vegetatively only. And then the other one, oops, sorry, hang on. I touched that too much. Um, the other one is our good friend, oxalis or sourgrass or whatever you want to call it. This is you know, there's two kinds of oxalis, and this is the sourgrass one with the tall stem. I remember as a kid, man, this was in everybody's yard when I was a kid because we didn't know how bad it was, right? Um, and I remember, you know, consuming lots of sourgrass. Well, this thing does not make seeds. So we are not going to worry about seed spread. What we are going to worry about are those tiny little bulbs that you see in the hand right there. That's what they look like when they're full size before they're full size, they're even harder to find in the dirt. But that's where all the energy for that weed is living and why it is so hard to get rid of. Okay, oh, good question too. What does growing vegetatively mean? That means it is not, it's growing by green parts of the plant, some part of the plant that is green um, or you know alive, not by uh, the spread of seeds. So, um, so those are some hot button ones, but then, with 95% of the weeds by seed, um, there's still some really interesting data in here. So I took all of those weeds and I looked to see, and of course, some of these are multiple categories, but um, with um, uh, with with the weeds that are just are just dis dispersed with uh, wind, that's the biggest category. Probably doesn't surprise you much when you think about the stuff you've seen in your yard. But the next biggest spreader of seeds our people and pets and our movement in spaces. So whether it's going from one person's backyard to the next or going on a hike and then bringing things home, um, that is totally how things get spread. Um, animals, when I separate that from pets, I really mean like wild animals, things we don't have control over. Um, soil movement would mean things like landscaping or um, machinery or things like that that would be moving things around. So many, Weeds travel in water, they'll, or the seeds will float. Um, but then there's this category, and this is the one that I go, oh gosh, okay. So if I had 20 weeds in my yard, this might be the one I wanna pay attention to. I do not want explosive seeds all over my yard. So identifying what these are is really helpful. So let's take a look. There's two on my list right here today. Um, cut leaf geranium. This is having a pretty good year this year. So I brought this one in particular because out of this list, this one is one I see in shady spots all the time. And many people actually look at the leaf and think to themselves, oh, look at that leaf and that flower. Wow, that really looks like a geranium. Well, okay, so cut leaf geranium. It's a weed though. I mean, if you love it, okay, but explosive seeds means you better love it a lot because it's gonna be all over. And the other one, this is, uh, this is Fillory's year. Um, this has got a sort of flat rosette with a light purple flower. Um, if you don't recognize it yet, it makes these seed pods that I remember as a kid, pulling these off, splitting them with a nail and daisy chaining them into jewelry. I wouldn't be surprised if you also did that. Um, and then this guy, when those seed pods open, this is why. That's the seed out of that seed pod. Look at that lovely spiral. This thing drills itself into the ground. It uses humidity to swell and contract and it drills itself into the ground. So it's uh, pretty tough to um, eradicate this thing once the weeds have spread everywhere. So that's a good example of explosive seeds. Um, another category that sort of hmm, concerns me, the weeds that germinate without light um because well that means you can't really mulch your way out of these problems um one example um not everybody in the county will deal with this but um some people see regular smattering of poison hemlock yes that poison hemlock the one of book lore um 
and the other one that we see all over. And if you've driven by agriculture, you probably see this one, it's prickly lettuce. Um, and it is kind of prickly and it can get quite tall. And, um, but it shows up in backyards as much as anything else. So those are ones to be aware of that, that you'll still probably deal with those. Um, if you don't have a physical barrier, um, they will occasionally pop up with mulch, et cetera. And then last category of things I really wanna talk about are the things with two types of seeds. Guess what? There's only one of those, but it's very alarming. This is yellow star thistle. This is by far the most problem weed um, in rangeland all over California and the rest of the state. This is a terrible weed. You can't have goats or sheep out um, mowing down the rest of the problematic weeds in a space that is covered in yellow star thistle. They either won't eat it or they will eat it and they will injure themselves eating it. Um, those thistles are terrible. Um, yellow star thistle currently covers more than 15% of the landmass in California. That's how bad this weed is. So um, most of you in a backyard situation are not going to deal with this, but if you are like Louise and you have some open space, <laughs> this one is um, this one is a this one is a problem plant. Um, but if you go to a county park, you will see it all over. My dad was a pest control chemist um, for Van Waters and Rogers. He spent a good half of his career trying to find something that will kill this thing. He was not successful. Um, and then, okay, good, everything loaded. And then the things that are not um, spread by seeds. About 31% of the weeds I studied also reproduce vegetatively, which means some part of the plant turned into new plants. You don't actually need to know all the parts and what they look like, you just need to know how they work. You don't wanna pull part of a plant like this and have it break into 10 more plants, helping it along. It's just all the underground parts, whether they're bulbs, corms, tubers, rhizomes, they represent an incredible reserve energy. So your strategy needs to be exhaust that energy or take an herbicide down into the underground parts to weaken it. So if you look at the pictures sort of from um, top to bottom, on the top right, um, there are two weeds there. That is Aromatallicum. Um, that is uh, spread, the, the big mass on the left-hand side that's sort of pinkish, um, that, that's a corm um, from that particular weed, frequently spread by birds. Many people let this thing come up going, oh, it must be a calla lily, I'm getting volunteer calla lily. No, sorry, it's not. Um, and the thing on the right is so sort of tucking underneath it. It's nearly always tucked underneath something else. Um, that's called bridal creeper. Um, and that spreads by rhizomes. That's the sort of picture in the middle. You can see it coming out of a rhizome. And the bottom is an example. This is a better picture than Bermuda grass, but this is what Bermuda grass does. This is why Bermuda grass, even though some people have it as their lawn, why it's a weed. It can travel eight feet underground and underneath the complete driveway and come out the other side. So if your neighbor has Bermuda grass, the four feet between yourself and um, their yard, you know, it's, it's a tough one to deal with. Any part of that, those white sections that break off, those are rhizomes, any part of them, any small section will turn into another plant. And then let's talk a little bit about the great weapons you have to arm yourself for battle. Um, most of you won't need this, but I am going to mention it because there is somebody who's dealing with a uh, broom in their space. This is called the uprooter. Um, it is um, being, you know, they're showing how it's used on the left hand side. It is perfect for taking out broom, acacia, and any of those woody plants, um, including on hillsides and stuff where it comes out. The tool is expensive. It's between, you know, it's 180 to 200 and something dollars, um, depending on what size you get. But if you have broom on your property, uh, you and your neighbors might really want to go in on one of these tools because um, it really gives you a leg up. And of course, safety is going to be the first step. You only have to grab stinging nettle. There's a lot of stinging nettle this year. Um, 
only once to remember that gardening gloves are worth grabbing even before you grab one weed. Protect your eyes and your face. It's more than social distancing. It keeps dirt and dust out of your eyes and nose, um, including potential irritants from a weed you didn't know, you know was gonna be a problem. Putting on a hat just doesn't just protect you from the sun. It keeps you walking into eye level branches when the sun is in your face, which totally happens when you're looking at the ground for weeds. Um, thistles have thorns, poison oak. It's no joke if you're sensitive. So you might need what they call gauntlet or rose gloves. Um, and it's generally recommended to wear a long sleeve shirt in those kind of situations. Um, I really love the gloves that are in the middle, not that you know I'm advocating for a particular brand, just the style where it's sort of um, stretchy fabric. Um, I get a lot of tactile sensation, so I can feel around um, to find the sort of place to grab a tap root. Um, and because when I'm done gardening, I can wash them really well when they're still on my hands. If I've, if I've dealt with a weed that was an irritant, I actually wash the gloves while they're on with Fells naphtha soap or something, or that will take um, any oils away, um, or just soap and water, and then I hang them out to dry. Um, but if I am working with chemicals, I do wear nitrile gloves instead. Let's look at a couple of the tools you might use. Um, mowers and weed whackers can cut taller weeds down to size, but if they're used at the wrong time, they also have the power to spread seeds. Wind was already doing that. Your clothes were already doing that, right? For your own safety, do not use string trimmers on wet weeds. Um, I've made jokes Myself, I know about killing weeds with fire, and you probably have too, and there's something that really bugged you, bindweed or Bermuda. But the reality is that many invasive species laugh in the face of fire, and they use it to their advantage. Um, the only time a propane torch or what they call weed burner should be used in California is to burn small seedlings very shortly after rain, um, because it's fire damage is, or fire concern is too great. Um, and then there's a tool that I love, the electric chainsaw. Um, if you really do have woody weeds, um, that, um, that's, a, that's a great tool to uh, lower, the, lower the bar um, and make sure your arms aren't sore when you're weeding. But then the hand tools. By far, you know, these are the tools that I love the most. The dandelion weeder um, is a tool sort of like a camping fork, and this would be my desert island tool. I don't always use it um, picking up a rosette. I use it for everything. I will often stab in a circle um, to loosen the dirt around a plant. Um, if you don't have dandelion weeder, but you have a really big, um, uh, you know, tools, uh, and, um, a screwdriver or something, you can also use that. Um, my second favorite tool is a mattock. Um, the top one there is a pick type and the bottom is a cultivator. It doesn't really matter, like whatever you like, but they're both really great for stabbing and loosening soil around a big weed or often a bunch of small ones so that you can just kind of scoop them up with your hands. For more woody weeds, um, like a coast live oak that a squirrel planted and is now growing in the middle of another plant until it got pretty substantial in size, you know, pruning saw, loppers, bypass pruners, something like that are needed. Um, for problems like privet and tree of heaven, if you're dealing with them, a pruning saw allows you to make a cut and score the trunk with an X or a hatch mark um, that also helps to prevent resprouting. Um, and then um, soil knife, you know, that's sort of, if you prefer that to a mattock, um, and a hula ho, um, they can cut a tap root and leave something behind to resprout. So I often use a hula ho with weeds that have shallow roots or an area where I just, I can't, I can't, for other reasons, um, dig in and um, uh, you know get tools in to get very deep with the roots. Um, an example might be that space between your driveway and your sidewalk, or you know something like that, where you might have a, um, a border, a bender board, or something you don't want to hurt. And then there's tools for leverage. Um, a round point shovel is really great, um, but new ones are made with fiberglass handles um, and they will split if you are using them for leverage. So you might want to grab a pry bar or what they call a digging bar as well. Um, the top right hand tools are firefighter, wildland firefighter tools, and they're great tools for good reason. They can dig deep, they can clear big areas, they can pull vines down off of trees. Um, if your job is big, maybe try those on for size. 
Um, I totally remember seeing the garden wheel as an as seen on TV Saturday morning kind of thing. Um, but as I've gotten older and I get really tired being on my knees for a long time with weeding, if I got a big patch, I love to put the tines right over a couple big weeds and twist and I can get a big area so that when I get down and I go to grab the weeds, I'm not spending a whole lot of time on my knees. Um, and then stand up weeders, some people are, really love these and it might help if you can't get down on the ground, but their success is limited to soft soil and a tap root and not all weeds are gonna be in that category. And then I know what you're thinking, am I really gonna talk about herbicides? I, yeah, I'm going to, because it's a really important tool in our box. And what you might picture when I say glyphosate, commercially known as Roundup, is not at all what IPM is about, or, you know, when you're thinking about Roundup ready weeds. IPM advocates that the least harmful but effective chemicals will be used and they will apply, be applied in the least harmful way. Sometimes we need chemical assistance to address a species that's far and away out competing the native plants in our system. So here's the tools here, a paintbrush. You can use it to paint directly on a leaf, on a stem or a stump from a woody species that's gotta go. Um, the, a really popular tool for land managers who are dealing with this over and over again. They literally go out with a bingo dauber full of Roundup or uh, typical or the other weed. They will go out there with that and a chainsaw. You can apply it just where you want it. Um, and including a weed that's been really tough to eradicate because it might be growing in the shadow of something that you want very much. Um, there are times when a spray bottle is a better tool for a lighter touch over a patch of weeds. And occasionally the patch is large enough that a pump sprayer makes sense. If you are dealing with Bermuda grass or something like that in your lawn, this is where a pump sprayer can be kind of helpful. When some chemical or you know some chemicals are sold in those hose attachment applicators, they're really tough to control attached to a full length flow, full strength flow from a hose, and they're not in the spirit of IPM. So when I've had to purchase those ready to spray bottles because I literally couldn't get anything else, I've used nitrile gloves, diluted and transferred the contents to something I can control the output of. So um, that might be worth um, thinking about if that's what you're dealing. So for selective herbicides for Bermuda grass and cool season turf, oh God, that, that stuff smells terrible, but it really does work. Um, but I often, I, I've had better success knocking it back when I get it exactly where I can see the Bermuda grass instead of like all over the whole space with the hose anyways. Um, you are totally encouraged to utilize UPM, IPM in your own weed management and consider the environment and your personal health and ability when you weed in your spaces. Um, but if you are still feeling conflicted about the use of chemicals and weed control, I urge you to read the Weed Workers Handbook and Best Management Practices for Non-Chemical Weed Control PDFs. Those are linked in the physical resources. Um, and then in the other, under the interesting links, there's the um, National Center for Invasive Species video on salt cedar so that you know what open space and other land managers are dealing with and the value of chemical support for certain invasive species in those spaces. So please don't use a hose applicator. And now you're going, but, 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 what about those individual weeds? What am I gonna do if I don't know what it is and how to deal with it? So let's talk about the stuff in your yard. If you don't know what it is, I mean, I know what these are, or I wouldn't have chosen the pictures, but many of you probably don't recognize the weed on the left. That's bindweed. And um, yeah, that's just a problem plant. Um, bindweed may survive the nuclear apocalypse. So um, we manage it. We don't cure ourselves of it. Um, and the one on the right is catchweed bed straw. And I bet many of you have dealt with it at one point. If you touch this weed, it will instantly stick to your gloves. And I guarantee you, if you go to Google and type in something like UCANR, weed like Velcro, you will immediately get the information on catchweed bed straw. It's really great that way. So um, what do you do though, if you wanna find this out? So again, I, this is a small screenshot of the, the live um, data that you can find for yourself on um, the UCANR weed or UC ANR, UC IPM weed photo gallery. Um, and this is just sort of a screenshot of like the hot places I linked you right to it. Um, but I wanted you to know 
in part because I think this is not the most user-friendly part of this. The part where it says list of all weeds, it is, it is a list, but it is not a list with a picture on it. So if you don't know what it is, you can identify it. If you know it's a broadleaf, for example, um, or you think it's a grass, sometimes if you're not sure, check grasses and sedges. But the place where it says identification, wouldn't it be great if it said identification photos? It doesn't, but that's where the photos are. Okay, so um, that's where you want to go. Another tool um, is the weed identification tool. Um, again, linked here. If you're not finding it the first round, um, this is one of those things that will sort of help you with what we call a Boolean search. It's sort of um, so you want to keep the broadest search terms that you can. But if you searched, for example, California and Woody, and then you go to step two, and you go a little bit farther down, and you say multiple trunks. That is all you need actually to get to the information on Tree of Heaven. It's that simple. So um, it will be a little bit more complicated when you're trying to identify grasses from one another, um, but um, this is another really great tool. And then sometimes we just don't wanna go on the internet. We wanna solve this problem while we're out in the garden. And so, um, these books that I have right here, um, giant books, I don't think you need them, but I did link them in case anybody felt like it. Um, the state um, creates these weed pest identification cards and it's the top 48 weeds that you're likely to deal with. And it has a little picture of them in all stages of their life cycle. And you can go through the photo side and you can flip to the back and you can find out all the information you would like to find out about them. It's every master gardener has one and I totally encourage you. It's like 20 bucks. I totally, if weeds are driving you crazy, like in your urban yard or grab one, um, grab one for yourself. It's a really handy thing to have. Um, you can, of course, identify your weeds with those photo pictures, but there are plant ID apps, um, including ones you don't have to pay for. You can join Facebook groups, um, even lurk in Facebook groups focused on plant IDs and you can contact the help desk. So if you're stuck and you don't know and you don't even want to search, you just want somebody to help you out, send the help desk a message with a picture of your weed and whatever else you can describe about it and we will help you. But then what happens when you find your weed information? Um, you probably recognize the first one. Um, here's a dandelion, right? We never get rid of dandelions. Um, so I'm going to take you into the information. I again, you're going to be able to find this when you if you go to that um, list of weeds, you will find dandelion. And here I've gone. This is live on the web. Um, here's the information on dandelion. So there's pictures of you know there's the you know there's the individual seed. This is what it looks like when it's in seedling form. There's all this information. Um, it's gonna describe where you might find it. Obviously, we know we find dandelion everywhere, but there are other weeds um, that you go, oh, that, that probably isn't the one I'm looking for because they describe it as being somewhere else. Um, so you get all this information and then you get what is the most important part, right? How does it reproduce? It reproduces by seeds that can germinate almost year round. And the tap roots can also send off new shoots. So you can mow your lawn before a, a dandelion seeds and often control how many seeds it puts out, but the tap roots are always going to send off new shoots. Um, sometimes it'll give you things that people confuse with dandelion. Um, and then there's more information down here. Um, and I chose this as a good example because um, UC has information for agriculture, for big business agriculture and small farms and then for gardens and landscapes. So you can find information for both. The pest management guidelines are for the big guys and um, the pest notes are the ones for us, okay? Um, I'm gonna go back real quick here because I here's, um, this is called Petty Spurge. It's another one of those with explosive seeds. Um, and I want to talk about a pest note.
So here is a pest note. There will not be a pest note for every weed, but there are for many, many weeds. They describe, a pet, um, this is petty spurge. It is in the category of many other spurges. Um, here's a spotted spurge. There's many in the family um, and they all have a lot of, here's the biology information, right? The, the things that I told you, you should pay attention to. The impact um, I often will tell you like just, you know, how bad it is and what we're thinking about here. And then you won't always see a chart like this, but this is actually gonna tell you information to to, if you need to determine the differences between them. Um, and then here's the part that's really helpful in a pest note, the management. And I realize this is all small text and I'm not gonna, I'm not asking you to read it. Just notice that the, in the headlines, the management starts with cultural control. What can you do that can make a difference for this particular weed? Okay, weeding or cultivating, solarization, mulching, turf management. Um, you know, the example for dispurges, right, is keep your grass healthy. Um, you know, and then there's information on chemical control. Sometimes you'll actually see a chart, and sometimes you'll just see a short list. So they mention. The, the great thing about a pest note is that they will mention um, herbicides that may make a difference, and they'll also tell you the stuff that they tested that didn't work, so you can skip that step. Um, and sometimes they'll mention that they're, you know, here, here's a good example, post-emergent herbicide. Um, 2,4-D or dicamba combination products, um, triclopyr, however that's pronounced, um, and glyphosate, Roundup, right? Um, 2,4-D and its combinations do not control the larger, more mature spotted spurge plants. So that's really helpful to know because 2,4-D has a problem with runoff. I wouldn't recommend using it if you don't have to. So in this case, you go, hmm, I'm either going to pull it and deal with it that way, or I might want to use Roundup. Um, so this will tell you too, often it'll mention, oh, this pesticide and this pesticide work, but you as a consumer can't buy those. So here are the best ones available to you. So um, there you go. Let me go back to my presentation here. And then sort of every year is going to be different. Man, this is the year for fillery. This is it, okay? Um, your own life experience is probably going to tell you this too. Some weeds persist, and sometimes you can prevent a 2021 crop, but it's going to take diligence to address the damage of the past. Some weeds will survive the nuclear apocalypse, even if the cockroaches die. Um, every year is really different. Winter temperatures, the rainfall pattern. Is it falling in the fall? Is it falling in the spring? How much rain did we get? What are the ground conditions? What kind of wildlife has been visiting your yard lately? Um, do you have new neighbors or have you done construction or repairs in your yard, irrigation upgrades? Did you bring in new compost or mulch? I mean, I really hope you brought in new compost or mulch um, or plants, um, new plants that you brought from nurseries. Um, you know, uh, this winter, we've had 35 mile an hour wind in my neighborhood. So I'm expecting that wind driven seeds are going to appear in some new numbers in my yard this spring as I start gardening in other areas. Um, and of course, birds and animals are a great source of new seeds everywhere. Um, and while compost and mulch come with viable seeds sometimes, like it's not usually something that you can't take in stride. It's not as much of a concern as the other spread. So then I'm going to talk about sort of um, the cultural and physical controls that you can use broadly here. Um, hand pulling. There's my dance line reader in use. Um, so many weeds, so many, if you can hand pull it before it flowers, some things have seeded almost as soon as they flower. So if you can pull it before it flowers, woohoo, you know, go you. Um, Sometimes you've got something like a, a grass and maybe you can't pull out the whole grass. The ground is really stiff and where you don't have a lot of time and you can come around with bypass pruners and cut off all the flowers or seed heads and throw it in the trash. Um, you're going to be able to stop a new crop of weeds, even if you can't deal with all the vegetation in the ground. Um, add organic matter. Um, the top picture there, there is compost. The bottom one is um, cocoa guar. Um, or, you know, pulp from coconut. Um, it's, um, it's another great option. <laughs> Sometimes it can suppress weeds. You should be aware because it can hurt your other plants, but 
oftentimes um, it comes in a brick and you have to soak the brick in a lot of water and kind of um, to dilute it because it's extremely salty. But in some cases I have noticed actually where I spread it as mulch um, temporarily, that salt seems to suppress um, some weeds while not really bothering the big plants that I put next to it. Um, but adding organic matter is not just good for the plants you want. There are a number of weeds like mallow that can grow real tall, right? Six feet tall in that space, but they can't actually support all that height, all that size in soft soil. And sometimes they won't even germinate unless the soil is hard enough for them to support themselves. I encourage you to join the no-till movement and avoid disturbing that old seed bank that needs help getting to light, right? There will always be seeds underground. Um, if you combine it with regular top dressing of organic matter, you're preserving and improving soil structure. It's great for your plants and it's also great to limit how many weeds you have to deal with in a specific period of time. So avoid the tiller. And then avoid the weed cloth, the landscape fabric, whatever you call it, unless it's going under hardscape or a shed or something, it's actually worse than nothing. It may help for a short while, but wind and people movement made soil collects on top. And then you go from no weeds to weeds and really stubborn roots being actually protected by the fabric. And it's not really fabric, it's plastic, um, to shredded fabric, plastic, popping up everywhere. Um, when it starts unrolling itself, basically, um, as it breaks up, wild animals like squirrels and birds and stuff will end up pulling on it and making it worse. Cardboard, relatively harmless and will decompose. It can work in a short period of time, um, but limit it for weed patches that you can't deal with on top of mulch alone. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, it's not necessarily a great idea to use boxes of um or you know, cardboard boxes versus rolled cardboard. Um, and I don't know if you need to really buy cardboard just for this purpose, unless you have an area that you're trying to suppress very temporarily while you get something else established. Um, soil solarization, this is so tricky. You'll see this mentioned in the pest notes, but it's not really effective for the Bay Area because we're too close to the coast. So the state admits this, but you know, it's really helpful in the Central Valley and other places. For it to work well, you really need hot day and warm night temperatures, and most of our nights are cooler. Depending on the seed bank and the soil, it may work in smaller spaces if you give it enough time, but you have to start early. Um, you're looking for like May to July, the longest sunlight hours, not necessarily the hottest daytime temperatures overall. Um, and the jury's really out on black or clear plastic. Um, since we don't, since we know that it's not a perfect solution here, um, Nobody is sure which plastic um, is better, but um, it has its limitations too because you have to do something with that plastic. Once it's been sitting in the sun for two months, you probably can't reuse it and it's black plastic that then has to go to the landfill. And then there's mulch. Magic, magic, magic mulch. If you lay it deep enough, like five to six inches, avoid the crown of any tree or shrub, but you can prevent seedlings needing or seeds that need sunlight from germinating. They will help you conserve water. So those water-wise plants thrive and the thirsty, really thirsty type of weeds that can't even get started. Um, you know, while we know there's weed seeds that will survive no matter what, um, there are plenty of others that you can actually crowd out completely with mulch until the seed has reached an age that it's no longer viable. Sorry, bindweed is not one of those. We are pretty sure that lasts decades, maybe thousands of years. And then there's those other things, you know, um, mowing can prevent those taller weeds from going to seeds, but they do spread weed seeds. And um, some, some plants um, or some seeds continue to mature when they're cut or they're re-sprout from cuts. I mentioned not using a string trimmer on wet weeds because of user injury, but if you use it on dry weeds that are flowering, have already gone to seed, you are going to fling seeds far and wide. It's very limited in use. Um, if you need a pruning saw, um, then we talked about sort of that combo. If you, if you apply an herbicide at the same time and know some species that will say in the pest note, you've got to do it within five minutes or something. Um, just a ring around the stump. See that yellow ring? That's the cambium layer. That's the growing layer of the, uh, um, of the woody species. If you can get Roundup right there, you can 
stunt that plant. You can it will soak the roundup in, it will go down to the roots. With some species, if you are dealing with tree of heaven or um, privet, um, that's well established, you may want to cut it higher, um, make little hatch marks, put the roundup on it, do all of those things. Um, give yourself room to come back and cut it um, cut three, somewhere between three and six months later, cut it off another six inches lower, do the same thing. Um, sometimes it does take um, that action repeated once, twice, three times um, to actually get all the way um, into the into the plant, um, you know, all the way into the roots. Um, and yes, Jennifer, uh, getting five to six inches of mulch is 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 a huge amount. Um, that's where services like um, uh, Chip It, where you can order um, and combine with your neighbors, because you can make you you can get a lot of uh, mulch is. Uh, is really helpful, but it really does take you, the smaller the pieces of mulch, um, the, you know, more likely it'll nest together and keep chip drop, thank you. Um, the more likely you can cut the sunlight out, um, but for the most part, we need the big chunks and a lot of it in order to keep the sun out, but also, um, you know, keep it in place, especially when wildlife comes to visit. And then those chemical controls, and I know people really want to know, does vinegar work? Well, IPM guidelines for chemical control are three things. Be sure the herbicide label lists the weed species that you want to control. Make sure the label says that it's safe to apply on or around the other plants where you intend to use it. For example, um, the uh, stuff for Bermuda grass and turf says don't use it near salvia, and they are not kidding. Um, don't let it run off into salvia, which is why it shouldn't be used in a hose if you have salvia around your lawn. Um, three, be sure that the weeds you target are in a stage that is susceptible to the herbicide, because many, you know, as it mentioned in that spurge thing, oftentimes by the, by the time the, the weed is matured, it's not going to work. That recipe going around for dinner, vinegar and dish soap, it's a chemical control. Grocery store vinegar is 5% acetic acid. Horticultural vinegar is 20 to 30%. 20% is enough to blind you. I like horticultural vinegar. It's great, but it will eat the metal on the paintbrush that I told you you might want to apply things. If you apply it early on a sunny summer day, you can totally burn weeds with it. It's great for those driveway weeds, etc. But it's really short acting and it's not going to address stored energy in growing parts underground. So don't bother on your sour grass Oxalis. It's not going to do anything. Um, and be careful because for sure, in my case, I actually really like um, for the space, um, I like to order the glacial acetic acid, which is the 99% and dilute it to the 20%. Um, I do it outside with safety glasses and gloves and everything. Um, it's not the same thing as vinegar you buy in the grocery store, and it's not going to work. And it's not going to work on a cloudy day. It's not going to work in the winter. Um, really, like it's too, it's almost too early in the year still to make it, uh, to make a difference. But the other part of that recipe was dish soap. And the dish soap in that internet recipe is functioning as a surfactant. But I don't recommend it. If you're choosing a delivery method like the ones that I mentioned um, that will minimize impact beyond your target weed. So we're for Air Metallica where I have a really hard time with that. I'm using Roundup on the dauber or paintbrush. You really don't want soap suds in your dauber. You really don't want it in your spray bottle and you don't want it interfering with your ability to put pressure in your tank sprayer. So when you use an herbicide, use surfactant wetting agents or adjuvants that are recommended by the manufacturer. So you will often find them noted. Um, I have an example right here, like that was just a generic bottle, um, the surfactant for herbicide. This particular type, um, you'll find several brands, is made from the yucca tree, and it is meant to biodegrade, um, where um, we're not exactly sure that dish soap is gonna biodegrade in the soil, couldn't potentially make the soil hydrophobic. So. Um, you might want to try an actual surfactant, and more is not better. Um, more is not better. So the vinegar has its place. 
Um, but um, it's not the end all be all and it's not gonna get everything. So by knowing your weed, you'll know better what to choose. Um, there is discussion of banning glyphosate because of the harm it can cause to people and animals. And it really gets a bad rap, but it is better than many of the alternatives because it doesn't adversely affect our waterways. It actually breaks down in water. Um, that's why it's really important for everyone to use chemical best control responsibly in everyday gardening so that the tools remain legal for those who are working to eradicate the plant species that are harming our native plants, insects, and animals. The state of California estimates that somewhere upwards of 70% of misuse or excessive use of herbicides and pesticides are individual consumers in residential spaces. So sometimes you're gonna need it. You totally may wanna try all biological, cultural, and physical controls before employing chemicals, but not everybody is the same. Not everybody has the same abilities. I want people to garden until they're really old and keep gardening um, until they're gone. A decade ago, when I moved into my house, I had a sea of weeds. I'm not kidding. I had the mallow, just like the mallow on the fence. I was proud of my ability to hand weed for 30 hours every spring. And I really did knock out um, a lot of that seed bank and tap roots and everything from my space by doing that. But now I have arthritis in my thumbs. So I have to be way more thoughtful about what I pull. Um, so match your problem and your abilities. Sometimes mulch is my best friend. Occasionally, uh, glyphosate is, is going to come in as well. So I want to take your questions. There's probably a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, let's, um, let's go there. Um, I see a number of questions back here. Um, Louise, have you, do you have any aside that you um, would like me to start with or should I just sort of? I've been, I've... I've been keeping an eye on the chat. Um, do you want to just look through the chat and answer them yourself or do you want me to feed, feed you a few that I think are more? No, why don't you feed me something to get started while I get the window bigger here. Okay. Um, one good question, do herbicides harm bees and other beneficial insects? Yes, they absolutely can. Pretty much anything can. Um, one of the other benefits to sort of where we hope to use um, herbicides and vinegar is one of those things that could um, can still hurt bees. Um, you don't wanna use it on some flower that the bees are visiting, but one of the best reasons for using something like a paintbrush or um, a dauber and is it really you can nail it on just the stump or in you know just the leaves of something um, which can limit the exposure another thing you can consider if you are dealing with a plant that is near something that the bees love so you've got this gorgeous salvia and the bees are all over it but you've got this little problem underneath it um, if you go out and put it out there, even when it's wet, um, if you do that in the evening after the bees are gone, um, then it will dry and be harmless to the bees by the time they're out the next morning. Great. Um, can you address bindweed specifically, strategies for bindweed? <laughs> strategies for bindweed. Um, master gardeners have tried so many methods. Um, we have a great big piece of property, um, Marshall Cotto Park. Some of you might have visited it um, for um, the great outdoors. And there's bindweed all over out there. Um, I got bindweed in a little section of my lawn or yard after I brought some soil in from something. And I was like, oh no, I haven't dealt with this one before. Um, many strategies. If it is little, go ahead and pull it. If it's little, go ahead and pull it. If you want to knock it back, you could try vinegar or Roundup, you know, I, depending on what you've got. It's hard. I used a, um, a spray bottle um, when I used that, um, but most of the time I keep seeing it come up too early in the spring for vinegar to make a difference. So that's where it sort of Roundup has come in. Um, you can do that if there's nothing else nearby it. Um, but what really just knocked it out was the mulch we put six inches of mulch in a big section there. Once I cleared out all the green matter that I could see and then I mulched and um, that makes a big difference. And our large scale problem um, at the Marshall Cottle like plot, um, mulch has been 
by far the most effective tool, um, mostly because the bindweed will come up and uh, and around the mulch, but um, but only in a quantity that makes it possible for um, those who are out there on the work crews to like pick it, right? Because you just want to get on top of it. You don't want to let it. Um, you don't want to let it um, build up any energy from the sun. So the sooner you can get it. So the mulch hasn't stopped it, but it really has sort of limited it to, oh, I can pick this amount in 10 minutes and, you know, get back to it. Can you, can you suggest any particular mulch that's good on slopes? Oh, <laughs> you know, I had a note to myself to say slopes. Um, and the problem of erosion is absolutely kind of beyond the scope today. Um, that's really tricky. I was really hoping to find some sort of resource for people who are dealing with slopes and erosion control, and I didn't find something that was good. And I think for somebody who's trying to answer that question, I would check that best management practices um, the um the thing from cal ipc that you need to give your email to get the pdf um, because they do discuss some of those um concerns but um you know land managers will often use things like that rolled up the green the sort of roll the mulch in the rolled tubes and stuff like that to address the um, erosion but it is really hard especially since if you're on a slope you probably have wild animals around trying to keep things covered completely yeah um, there is um, a gardener, not a master gardener, but if you look, search for um, Town Mouse Country Mouse, she is a blogger who lives in the Santa Cruz Mountains who does deal with um, slope-related weeds and eradication of problems. And I think she may, may have mentioned a few things that she's tried. There is not a whole lot of state resources for like official, like this is what you do. So I would have loved to refer people there. But. We are getting a ton of questions about very specific weeds. Um, mm -hmm. Before I ask some of those, I'd like to ask, why can you not use a weed whacker on wet weeds? What was the problem uh, there? So <laughs> that is a good question. So weed whacking on wet weeds, most of the time when you're dealing with that, you are, you are dealing with weeds with strong tap roots. And the chances of it breaking the string in the string trimmer and flicking the string somewhere is much higher than grass. And that's worse when it's wet? Yeah, it's really sturdy when it's wet. And then, and, and it can fling wet pieces of weed, real thick pieces of weed, you know, at someone in the city. They actually talk about um, land. Cal IPC talks about in large landsmen when they take a weed whacker, they actually wear um, um, forestry chaps if they use a weed whacker to protect their legs. Yeah. And we've had several people have asked about ivy specifically. <sighs> yes. <laughs> um, sucks. Cape ivy, you know, European ivy, it doesn't really matter. Um, one of the sort of um, ways to think about it is if you can eradicate it, um, contain it, create a space. If you are dealing with ivy that's come in over your fence or you've inherited a big piece of, um, of ivy, separate it, make a border. Um, think about wildland firefighting. They create this fire road to try to create a break, create a break um, between the ivy or you know another um, vegetatively spreading plant and the things that you know and love and want to keep and if you can't eradicate all of it um, create that break and radically enforce that break and slowly but surely as you you know sort of cut down on the other things you have to do you'll be able to work um, your way back into the plant it is definitely a long-term strategy but where you can't eradicate it um, if you can contain it um, that that helps a lot. And we had a question about blackberry. Is blackberry an invasive weed in California? Yes, Himalayan blackberry or Armenian blackberry, yes. So if you're like, wait, I didn't plant, plant blackberries. Why is this peering in my house? Yeah, it's been spread by birds. Um, but um, yeah, it's, um, it's the stuff that you see. I mean, you see it all over. If, if, if anybody's gone hiking at Henry Cowell, it's like covered in it. It just, it's covered in it. Um, 
spread my bird. So if it actually gets to the berry level, it's really, really hard to, you know, but yeah, it's an invasive species. If you did not put it there, <laughs> you can be like, oh yeah, this, this one ought to go. It's a tough one um, to, it usually takes a shovel and like, even if it's a really small plant or whatever. And um, that's a place where I would pull out the leather gloves for myself. Um, before yanking it out or try avoiding touching it and just pulling it out with a shovel if I could. I've had to deal with it a couple of times, yeah. Okay, um, how do you, uh, sorry, how do you deal with broadleaf weeds like clover or mint in a uh, grass? Like <laughs> maybe a lawn, I think we're talking about. Yes, and I do have turf, I have a child, and I don't know about you, but I love to walk in grass, in barefoot in the summer. I like love the feeling. So um, I'm a big fan. I do have some turf. Um, and yes, uh, you you are limited in what you can do um, when it's in your lawn. Um, lawn is an example. You can't use Roundup in your lawn. It will kill the lawn as well. Um, so if you are dealing with a creeping type of grass, um, you're gonna need to find the Bermuda grass slash, um, you know, um, uh, Kikiyu grass. There's a, there's a couple that um, that are sort of alternative grasses that um, are typically used in golf courses and then have been spread other places. Um, you're going to need to use something specific if the if it's the kind of weed that is spreading by rhizome. But 2,4-D dicamba, um, either one of those or the or the things that have those as a combo are um, are how you have to deal with broad broadleaf weeds in the lawn. Um, it's going to be tough. Mint is in the kind of rhizome family there. As long as it's getting irrigated, it's hard to kill. So you're going to need to look at the, um, so I, it wouldn't be the same for both. Um, I cannot pronounce the chemical that is used as Bermuda grass in the lawn, but literally if you look for Bermuda grass killer, it'll say, you know, the one that says for turf. Um, it's some very long name starts with an F. Uh, it smells like mothballs. It's vile, um, but it works. Um, it didn't work when I did it with a hose applicator. I first did try that way and it didn't work. But when I put it on a pump sprayer and I put it directly where I had the problem, I was able to knock it back. Um, there is also a season to some of those things. Um, you're gonna have a harder time getting rid of mint in the middle of summer than you will in the winter or early spring. So um, attacking that kind of thing um, early um, can also make a difference. When you and have you, a can, you can fish out the taproot of a dandelion in your lawn. And I usually will do that. I'll make a sweep of that before we go mow the lawn or something. I know I'm not going to get rid of it, but I can sort of limit the spread. I think we only have time for a couple more. Um, when you have weeds in your thick mulch that are coming up through your mulch, yeah. what's the best way to get rid of those? Should I use a hoe or down on my hands and knees? That's the place where I prefer hands and knees because the mulch is going to hold in so much moisture. Even if it hasn't rained recently, the soil should be softer. Um, and so I usually find, um, I usually find success just pulling. Um, and there's a sweet spot. Um, many times I say the sweet spot is for most weeds is somewhere between four and six inches tall. It's firm enough that you can grab and pull the whole thing, but not so firm in there that you're going to break off the taproot or something. Okay. Um, Dimondia. I have some Dimondia and other people are asking about it. Weeds and Dimondia. What's your, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I love it. I love the plant so much. It's so beautiful. It's such a great lawn alternative. Um, my official feeling is don't plant it. Don't even, don't, don't start. <laughs> Don't put anything in if you're dealing with Bermuda. If you can possibly help it, give yourself a year or two to like address and and you know cut back the Bermuda before you put anything else down. Um, but for most weeds, I find it's really fairly easy to pull grass weeds out of out of it um, in short order. But there isn't a whole lot you can use chemically on Dimondia. Yeah, because it will hurt it, especially if you have oxalis in Dimondia. That's a real tough one. Yeah. So if I had the, I think if I had oxalis in it and I was dealing with that, I might 
I might try because if I could get rid of the oxalis, the daimondia would grow back over the space. I might try, I would probably only use the dauber kind of method, but I might literally like put my hand down and kind of like push it out of the way and kind of try to daub on the oxalis. Um, if it is not the sour grass variety, you can just pull the green stuff. And if you just keep pulling the green stuff, it will run out of energy. But the sour grass type is harder to get rid of. Um, a question that I would like to ask is, do you know how to purchase glyphosate without surfactant in it? Mm. <laughs> yes. In fact, all that you buy typically does not have surfactant in it. You oh, usually okay. have it. Yeah, I usually it did. It will say, um, it will say if it has one in it, but um, most of the time, particularly when you buy the generic, like you buy the ace bottle of glyphosate or you know whatever it's not going to have it in it so i use the sort of like generic surfactant for herbicides and it's usually like a teaspoon per gallon or something but i have actually found that to be more to also help um when i've gone the vinegar route oh and when you do the vinegar thing like if if, if you really want to use dish up use the dish up please don't put the salt in there you don't need salt building up in your soil that's that's going to have long-term damage and um, make a soil less hospitable to the plants you might like to plant later. Oh dear, I see there's a message. Neighbors have planted bamboo. That is that one is beyond the scope the, sp the scope here. <laughs> that's that's terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I've seen at least four questions about the the weed with prickly balls that dry up and stick to your stuff. Yeah, and many of you were probably dealing with, I think 2020 was the year of burr clover. That's what it's called, burr clover. Um, again, that is um, like, if you look at the pest note um, for um, burr clover, burr clover slash black medic, um, it does mention what you can use. And while I don't remember the name of it, um, I think it also starts with an F. Um, it is by far, like far and away more effective, even if you are not in turf um, to use that particular herbicide, if you have a lot of it. Um, it is very important to try to beat it back, remove it, whatever, before it can seed. Um, the seeds are a pain in the butt and they're a real problem with people with animals because animals want to lick them off and you know, that's, um, but there, um, there is something in the pest note that will knock it back. I have found that if you, there's two concentrations um, listed on the bottle for it, and I've gone with the stronger one and then only applied it to the actual bird clover. And I got rid of most of it last year, so. That's fantastic. Um, I think we probably are out of time. <laughs> so <laughs> we have covered almost all the questions. This is fantastic. Really great presentation. Thank you, Pamela. And we'll turn it back over to Candace. Thank you so much, Louise and Pamela. Uh, yeah. Great presentation, very helpful. Um, as they mentioned, the Master Gardeners are all volunteers, highly trained volunteers. Um, who donate their time to helping the community. They live in the community and they help the community. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, we encourage you to keep watching the library's calendar of events. We are planning on bi-monthly talks, uh, continuing with the Master Gardeners. And as they mentioned, you can follow them. You can get on their email list and they'll let you know about upcoming uh, yes. events. And if we didn't answer your question today and you want help, I, I totally encourage you. I promise I'm probably going to be on help desk next week. Send a, send a message to help desk. Ask us your questions. We, we really would love um, to help you. We can provide you with the science. We can provide you with any anecdotal data we have of dealing with a particular we ourselves, but also anything else that you're dealing with because we know you're outside in the garden and really enjoying it a lot this time of year. Also, I forgot to mention that this recording will be posted on the YouTube channel of the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County within about a week. So if you want to check this information again, please check out our YouTube channel.